Well, one of the day is Thursday, October 22nd. How'd that happen? <laughs> 2020. This is the week in charts. I, was going, I don't thank all you guys and girls for being here, even though I forgot to put the banner up until about an hour ago. Looks like we've got a pretty good crowd tonight. Quality over quantity is what I say. So we're going to talk about, well, obviously current market conditions. I have a lot to say about that. We'll get to the live charts in a few minutes. Your questions on trading and your favorite stock picks. As usual, and this is for your benefit, hold off your questions that aren't related to the slides, just so my ADD doesn't kick in, and wait until we get to the live charts for your stock picks. That way they won't be buried in the questions. And ask about one ticker at a time and hit return. So we're going to talk about, well, I've been thinking a lot lately about talking about uh, or doing a show on surviving a drawdown. And that I started working on my slides like at 5 a.m. this morning and, and kind of went off on a lot of tangents. And there's so many things that I want to discuss. I realized that we're not going to be able to cover it in just one show. But I think that we can kind of get to the crux of it tonight. And if we need to follow up, and I'll go over my notes that I took this morning and see where we are on everything, we can certainly follow up in future shows. So I want to take a little break from the, the trading problems thing and talk about the drawdown, especially since the service itself is going through a drawdown. And I have gone through a drawdown lately. I haven't had a whole lot of big winners on my own to take care of things. And we'll talk about that in a little more detail in just one second. And the other thing, too, is part of my inspiration is in the Facebook group, I came out and said, hey, guys, I'm going through a drawdown. It's like, and then after I said that, I'm like, oh, man, I look like an idiot. I'm supposed to be the big, you know, the, the grand poobah. I'm supposed to be Big Dave, you know, know all this stuff. But the reality is you do go through drawdowns. It's a fact of life and to my surprise a lot of people private messaged me and emailed me and we're talking about drawdowns and uh, it comes to the territory uh, it happens spell the silent sh i'll probably demonetize at some point this video <laughs> anyway before we get all that there was a disclaimer screen as you know you can lose money trading or as often sum it up borrowing a line from my buddy greg mars all predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then so let's talk about surviving a drawdown and you know i could see that this is going to be something that's going to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow and there's something called the parkinson's effect and it's like the more time you have work will fill to consume the amount of time that you have obviously there's a lot more to it because i kind of went off on a, a cognitive bias on trading psychology and then i went through a bunch of spreadsheets recently to kind of show you the ebb and flow and as you'll see, it, it 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 kind of morphed into quite a few things. But in the end of this presentation, I think I could boil it all down to a few things that will really help you out. And again, as I was putting together, I found more and more slides from previous presentations that really, really dovetailed into what we're doing. And one of them is that, you know, you're pretty much always in a drawdown. And as I said lately, borrowing a line from Fortune's formula, which we're talking about the Kelly formula, Kelly Formula says, with Kelly Formula, you spend a lot of time less wealthy. Well, you will because you're making these huge bets. And it's a very great way to take a small account and run it up tremendously or blow it up. <laughs> you know? Hopefully, we can avoid the blow up part of this whole deal and just go with the run up part. But unfortunately, as a trend follower, you will spend a lot of your time less wealthy. And... I think this came, this slide came from Trading Full Circle. And one of my clients sent me his presentation a while back. And you could actually watch it on YouTube. It's pretty good. And it's Robert Frey. Who's the who's the guitarist? I always forget. Robert Gray, I think, is the guitarist, not to confuse with Robert Gray. But you put them side by side, they they don't look much alike. <laughs> anyway, he said you spend 75% of the time in a state of regret. And then Greg Morris said markets only make new highs 4% of the time. And when I first did a presentation just on the state of regret, I took a, one of our big winners or our biggest winner of the year, and I created a, a graph beneath the chart to show whether it was gaining ground or losing ground based on its prior peak high. And the entire bottom of the graph was nearly almost completely red. And it only made green, obviously, when the 
market was making new highs. And I forget which stock I used for that. Anyway, you could use any, you could pick the greatest winner there is that we held longer term, and it's going to have a lot of red in it. So it confirms what Greg said about markets only making new highs 4% of the time. So a lot of times a market is backing and filling. So even when you're doing fantastic, you spend a lot of time giving up money. Now, when you're to draw down, the first thing you need to ask yourself is what's changed in the markets? And you have to really have an open mind to do this. And we're going to get into perception and what you see might not always be what is, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago. But the bottom line is you need to ask yourself, has something changed in the markets? Now, again, like I said earlier, it's like when you start talking about these things, it's like, oh, it, it, it this, it this, it this. You, you keep, I kept finding myself adding more and more things. And I thought about the six most dangerous words on Wall Street. Now, anybody knows the four most dangerous words on Wall Street? If you're watching this on YouTube, put them down below. And it's known as the four most dangerous words. And I think that these six most dangerous words are just as dangerous or maybe even more dangerous. And those are, but it was working so well. A client recently called me. And he said he's not coming tonight because he's got dinner plans with his wife, so I could talk about him. <laughs> and we were trying to figure out what he was doing wrong. Now, as I told him before, look, you know, you're doing something that's a little bit off the cuff. You're doing the scalping thing. And if you could use a daily setup and then maybe trade around that daily setup, years ago I knew a, a trader that he would look for like a really good daily setup. And then he, he'd confirm it on a weekly chart. And then he'd sometimes take a look at a monthly chart. And then he would go in and, and scalp. And basically what he was doing was he's putting all of that behind him. And I knew someone in the past, especially when things are doing really, really, really well, they would just take the Landry list and they would buy the two or three top stocks intraday. And they would just stay in those two or three stop, top stocks all day long. And I did something very simpler Simpler, very similar back in the 90s, late 90s specifically. And that's just an intraday relative strength. Well, stuff like that works really, really well until it don't. And this gentleman here was doing a bit of a scalping thing, and now he's having trouble. He's trying to figure out what's changed. Well, for one thing, go in and look at the markets. And this year has provided us with a plethora of examples and a plethora of lessons. Hey Dave, I learned that word plethora from you. <laughs> so every time I say plethora, I think about that. I went to Germany and one guy came up afterwards and that was his his epiphany, the excitement. I'm like, oh, this guy's gonna come tell me how great I was. I learned that word from you, plethora, plethora. <laughs> Am I saying it right? Anyway, so early this year, we had kind of a nice end of a bull market. It was pretty cool. and. What does volatility do when the market just kind of grinds its way higher, especially on a persistent type of basis? Well, volatility begins to come off. And then obviously, finally, the market took this coronavirus serious and it began to tank. Well, what happens when the market began to tank? Well, the volatility shot through the roof. And what we have down below is the 50-day historical volatility. I bet my pants are kind of coming down. I better pull them up. So what's this guy's name? I don't want to give the impression of uh, <laughs> the guy that just got caught on webcam. Anyway, what's amazing though, is this market shot up so high, I don't remember in any distant, in any recent memories of seeing a market other than in 2020 with an HV approaching 70. I mean, that's just absolutely ridiculous if you ever spent any time studying the historical volatility indicator. Now. The market began to bottom out, had kind of a V-shaped recovery, and in and, and doing such, that volatility stayed really, really, really high. So as I've said before, volatility, if you squint your eyes and you make this chart much smaller, it looks like that volatility called the exact bottom. And maybe it did on our two or three or four-day volatility, as we talked about before. But in this particular case, using 50-day volatility called the exact bottom is what I think I meant to say earlier. The high in volatility the bottom in the stock market and as a general statement that is a true statement that will happen but there's lead and lag that happens also but anyway before i digress too far notice that as the market began to rally sharply 
the volatility stayed high, but then it started to flatten out. And as the market went sideways, the volatility began to come off. And as the market began, began to grind higher, what happened? The volatility began to implode a little bit. And then it just slowly came down, especially as those more volatile bars were dropped off. That's known as a drop-off effect. We had a little bit of a sell-off, which caused a little bit of a blip in volatility not that long ago, a few weeks ago. And then we tried to come back to brand new highs and the volatility rose a little bit, but we're down in the single digits, or I'm sorry, low double digits here, as you can see in volatility, correction. We're down below 20 in volatility. It's hard for me to read that little thing. Oh yeah, there it is right there, 19.3. So we're below 20 now. And then this is what I meant to say earlier this year, we were down around 10 or lower, which is ridiculously low. So there's been a lot of changes throughout the year. Earlier this year, the Robin Hood guys were crushing it. I got kind of jealous. I chased a few of those rabbits. I crushed it for a while. And then I began to get creamed. And as I was telling one of you guys in chat, it's like, yeah, something's, something's changed. That volatility has come off. Those go-go stocks weren't as crazy as it used to be. That may have... And I always get this one wrong, but that may have ran its course. I think that's what an English teacher in here wants to tell me. So lots of changing conditions throughout the year. So the point I was trying to make with this other person is like, what change that would affect his methodology? He's a really good scalper, but the volatility came off and maybe that's what changed. And so the reason I was talking about the trader before that, put all these big picture patterns behind him is like, if you could show me what you're doing and if you're using a pullback or a bow tie or one of my other, or, or pattern that I trade, not, I didn't invent the pullback. Somebody once came up to me, that pullback thing has put two of my daughters through college. Thank you. I'm like, uh, I didn't invent the pullback, but <laughs> that pullback thing you invented. No, I didn't invent it. But anyway, I may have popularized it a little bit. So the point I was trying to make there is what's changed in the market? And I think that, and again, this is how this thing can build and build and build. What's changed the markets relative to your methodology, okay? Now here's one that's a biggie. What's changed in you? And that's the crucial one. So a little introspection on your perception. Now, I talked a lot about perception a few weeks ago and I've done it in the past too. So I don't want to get too bogged down in this, but I was thinking tonight as I'm putting everything together or finishing putting together everything together, I was thinking that I really need to talk a lot about perception in order to kind of tie it all together and what's changing you. And the definition of perceive that I like as it relates to the markets is interpret or look on someone or something in a particular way. Now, I'm gonna go through these real quick because we talked about them a few weeks ago to get to the, the point that I wanna to get to. But if you are long a market and it has a little bit of a rally, even though it's going straight down, you're gonna see that little blue arrow as a big blue arrow, like, aha, it's reversed, now it's headed higher, I'm, I'm gonna be okay in this long. If you are short a market and the market's going straight up, and it has a little bit of a bullish pullback, something that I like quite a bit to trade, you're gonna say, oh, this thing has rolled over and is headed lower. One of the greatest difficulties encountered by the active trader is that of keeping his mind in a balanced and unprejudiced condition when he's heavily committed to either the long or the short side of the market. Unconsciously to himself, he permits a judgment to be swayed by his hopes. G.C. Selden, written over 100 years ago. I think this was written in 1916. My favorite books on the market, other than my own, of course, have been written at least 100 years ago. Well, there's a few that's been written 75 years ago. Anyway, so continuing along the lines of perception, let's see, so let's say the market's obviously headed higher and you're out of the market, you might reason that, well, it's just kind of chopping around or maybe it's just too overbought or some sort of other thing other than what is. Now, if you're losing money and there's a textbook set up that comes along, and as I've been saying since we've begun tonight, 
I'm in a drawdown, the service is in a drawdown. And it's hard to see a good opportunity when it comes along. So you might see this fantastic looking chart, and this is a case of a pattern I call Landry light, really simple, easy to recognize. You're just looking for 10 days where the lows are above the moving average and a pullback to that moving average, being a 30 day moving average. You could use a 20 if you like. But anyway, if you're losing money and a textbook setup comes along, you're going to say you're going to see that stock is maybe rolling over as opposed to pulling back. Or you might actually not see anything whatsoever. One of the things I was thinking about as I was working on my slides earlier this morning is in doing the trading service and in being forced to do the trading service from a selfish standpoint, the trading service helps me out tremendously is that when I'm in a drawdown like now and not feeling great about trading and being humbled by the markets, it's like, I probably don't wanna put in that two or three hours research or whatever it takes to come up with some setups, but knowing that you guys and girls, and we've got quite a few ladies now, so welcome, or waiting on me and depending on me, I sort of put my nose to the grindstone and I'm kind of, I always want to use the word antiseptic. I don't know if that's the right word or not, but I become detached in that analysis. And I wonder if I was just trading on my own, would I be so detached in the analysis? And I keep every presentation, I say, I'm not going to say it, but the, the intuition versus the intuition, which is at Sakoto. Now, let's say you're printing money. This is another problem that we'll revisit here in a few minutes. And you see something that's a bit of a mediocre setup. Yeah, it fits the it fits the rules. Okay, yeah, it's more than 10 bars and it's pulled back to the moving average. But this thing kind of shot up and came right back in. It's kind of all over the place. It's wide and loose. It's really not that fantastic of a setup. But you might see this in your mind. You might see that textbook setup. Now, this is sort of where this whole tangent I went off on, on the drawdown comes from. And it's like, we don't, we don't really see the market as they are. We see them as we are, okay? And that's kind of the whole thing I was kind of showing you a second ago with the perception. The average man is not blessed the curse. However, you may look at it with an analytical mind. We see as through a glass darkly, and that's what inspired me to do the next few slides. Our ideas are always enveloped in a haze and our reasoning powers work in a rut from which we find it painful, if not impossible to escape. Many of our emotions and some of our acts are merely automatic responses to external stimuli. Wonderful as it is, the development of the human brain it originated as an enlarged ganglion and its first response is still practically of that ganglion now as much as we've learned about neurology over the last hundred years mr selden pretty much nailed it we have this very primitive lower part of our brain lizard brain if you want to call it that the amygdala and all that stuff where's my brain i got a brain in here somewhere anyway Anyway, the stuff way down in your brain, and a lot of that emotion arises from that, or most of the emotion arises from that, and sort of controls your trading. And that's where, again, I want to use the word antiseptic, but detached is probably a better word. I know, easier said than done. So the seeing through the glass darkly got me thinking about how you see markets. And you're over here, and the market is over there on the right. And you don't actually see the market. You see the market through a perception prism. And I was trying to come up with something that would kind of distort or blur the image, the, the glass darkly that Mr. Selden thought about. And it came up with the idea of a perception prism. And I looked it up on the internet. It's, it's actually relates to something mythical or something else, but I, it's, it's not related to what I'm trying to say here. And if somebody else has, has heard of this before, please let me know. But we don't see the markets 
we see him through a bit of a a prism. And I don't know if you ever played with a prism as a kid, but it's pretty cool. You uh, shine light at one end, it comes out the other, comes out of the rainbow. <laughs> Trying to think of I think a few jokes there, but then I go there. So part of the prism that you're looking through is your life so let's suppose you have a fight with your spouse i'm guilty of this doing this before not like a knockdown drag out fight just a little skirmish <laughs> you know hardly any broken bones or whatever and then you go into your office like well i'll show her i'm going to put on this big s p trade or i'm going to do this. I'm going to over get really risky. I know I should only buy 100 shares of IPO, but I'm going to buy a thousand, you know. Or, of course, a fight with your significant other, or even worse, a fight with both. <laughs> and you're going to be tempted to revenge trade, which is a very bad thing. Now, I was thinking of things that fill this pyramid, and one would be an unexpected expense. Life comes at you fast. I found myself, it wasn't me, but someone else uh, had a, a ugly, ugly sprain and we ended up in the emergency room, okay? So that's, could have been an unexpected expense, but my wife did not want to go through that unexpected expense and that was her who twisted her ankle really bad and she threatened to get up and do jumping jacks if we didn't take her out of the emergency room. We have really bad insurance. Uh, it's so bad. I had a CAT scan once and I used a real cat, but anyway, I digress. So an unexpected expense, and even if it's, let's say, what's an emergency room visit now? $1,500, $2,000, it's not gonna kill you, but you're gonna feel a little pressure to try to get that back in the market. And that's a small expense. It could be a much bigger expense. You have a, you know, you guys with houses probably know. I have a new house now, thank God. But, you know, a unit goes out, an AC unit goes out, you're out 10 grand overnight. Now, the other thing, too, could be an expected expense. You know what your bills are, but you have bills, obviously. And it takes a lot of money to live, especially if you have kids in a house and everything else. Now, let's say you're hungover or you stayed up too late or you're tired. And... You need to think, is there anything major going on in your life? And here's the other thing. It could be something pretty minor. And you'll bring that into your trading, as I'll discuss again in a minute. You could have some bad test results for you or a loved one. And not to be a Debbie Downer, because the story has a happy ending. I'm still here. Hey. <laughs> not everybody's excited about that. But uh, a few weeks back, doctor called me all weekend, couldn't get a hold of me. <laughs> to those of you who've been trying to reach me, I'm, I'm probably the world's worst, and I, I'm going to try to get better at that. But usually, I have people call my wife; they need to get in touch with me because she's always got her phone and she knows where I am. Anyway, we got long story endless. I got some really bad test results, in, and the doctor tried to call me. It was it was almost a mirror, or uh, what's the correct word? Almost the exact results that my father had gotten a few years back, three years ago. And he lasted three weeks with these test results. So we pretty much knew it was kind of, it was, it was touch and go there for a while. And just having lived through that experience and seeing him go through the chemo and everything, which didn't work, <laughs> you know, I was like, well, this is it, you know, and I was pretty strong about it. And my wife breaks down crying and all. I'm like, I'm not going through chemo. I'm getting, I'm getting a motorcycle. I'm going to die in a fiery car crash. <laughs> I'm not going to take chemo. Anyway, long story endless, the next day, luckily, after some emergency tests, couple of uh, trips back and forth at the hospital, everything turned out to be okay. Well, for a day and a half, that hung over my head and I probably didn't sleep. I don't think I slept that well that night. And, you know, I was, I was thinking more about getting my affairs in order as opposed to trading. And then I still did come in here and I had a plan to follow and I worked on following my plan. But I knew in the back of my head that this trading thing wasn't nearly as important to me as everything else i was thinking about things like okay how am i going to have my wife shut down my trades do i call one of my peers and make sure he still has my phone number and stuff and, and can talk my wife or my wife's phone number and can talk her through shutting down everything 
should we leave some things open? I mean, trend following more on stuff, maybe we'll leave some things open. Anyway, so all that's going through my head. And obviously three years prior, seeing my father rush to the hospital, <laughs> that affected my thinking about the markets back then. So if you have an injury or illness to you or a loved one, and and the one point I'm trying to make in here, I know I'm being kind of morbid and all, but notice I have anything minor. So my wife twisted her ankle and she likes to move around. She likes to exercise and and uh, we like to exercise together a lot of times. And so like she could no longer do that. And she, she it made her angry that she had to wrap her ankle or wear a brace or ice her ankle and couldn't do the things that she wanted to do. And then if you guys been around for a while, you probably know if you're married, that is happy wife, happy life. So even something minor can affect you as part of that perception prism. So a major life event, good or bad, it doesn't matter if something happens, major, good or bad, or even a minor life event, good or bad. And by the way, I think being cognizant of your feelings and emotions or, or good, both good and bad are extremely important as a trader. Like this afternoon, I'm on fire. I feel great. It's like, why do I feel great? I'm losing money, but I feel great. Well, because I walked three miles earlier and then yesterday I biked 20 miles and then day before I did the Peloton, day before I did the Peloton. So it's like every day this week I got to exercise and that's just some little minor thing and I'm feeling fantastic. I got to make sure I don't take that euphoria and then push it into the markets and do something stupid. But the point is, I'm trying to make is, and believe it or not, I have one, is little things like that can change your attitude. Doing the first the beginning of the lockdowns, it's like I stopped going to the gym. I'm, I haven't gotten back to the gym yet. I'm a little nervous about that. I'm a bit of a germaphobe, and there's some other reasons too, but um, that's the main reason. I miss the gym, though. I really do. But, you know, I kind of backed off in the exercise, backed on, off in the gym, so I probably wasn't at my peak performance, and whether I wanted to admit it or not. Now, the point I made a few weeks back, and I'll probably beat the dead horse on forever, and I think I just kind of beat the dead horse on it again, is that your life is going to spill over to your trading, and your trading is going to spill over into your life. I was glued to the screen earlier this year quite a bit, and I no longer got to go on the walks and bike rides as much or at all with my wife. And it's like, so that was sort of my trading was sort of affecting my life. And then happy wife, happy life, my life was affecting my trading. So I, I go through this cycle quite a bit, as does everyone else out there with a pulse who is trading, except for those gurus on YouTube. But those gurus are probably, <laughs> probably right now. <laughs> which way do I point? Which, which way is the ad going to come from? And probably the ad on my channel. But that's fine. At least we'll make something off of them, right? Now, the perception prism when it comes to trading, and we can go on and on on this, obviously, but let's say you have a string of winners and you're feeling like God, and I started to draw out the, the ego curve that I've talked about before. You get a string of winner, winners, your ego curve shoots straight up, then you get a straight of losers, and all of a sudden that comes crashing down with your account, <laughs> of course, and then you feel like the best you could do is maybe go off to flip burgers. Now, let's say you missed a huge trade. I still think back to TLRY, which was a little bit too volatile for me to put as a setup in my trading service, but I did like the setup and it was in my Landry list and it did have a clean entry. And I think it ran 250 points or something before it crashed down. But with money management trailing stops, I think we could have caught a big piece of that. And I actually had one or two of you guys that actually made out on that. So congratulations to you. The point I'm trying to make here is even though that was a couple of years ago, I still think about that. There's many days I think about that trade. Now you might have a way too risky trade that paid off big. You may have picked up nickels in front of a bulldozer or, or worse, made a lot of money on a risky trade. And that's where your ego comes into play. It's hard to make a lot of money and not, again, feel that godlike complex. Now, 
one thing that can kind of mess with you a little bit, especially if you've been doing this for a long time, and a lot of the hedge fund managers got cream this year because they didn't adjust, okay? But it was hard, it was hard to watch these Robinhood guys come in and just absolutely print money because they didn't know what they were doing, but they were taking these little risky trades and they were just piling into the market and these go-go stocks were just going and going and going and going and going. And that's hard to see. I get a lot of feedback from you guys in the Facebook group and you're like, everybody seems to be printing money. And, and believe me, everybody's not printing money, okay? We do fairly well here and there. We have a few big winners here and there, but most of the time we're grinding it out. And, and that's a uh, little bit of a downside to the group is that it seems like everybody's always making money and there's always action everywhere. So it does take a little discipline, but the, the benefits far outweigh the cost. And I'll explain some of that in a minute. So there is a little FOMO that does happen, especially like a year like this year where the Robinhood guys are printing money or were printing money at least. But why not? Why aren't they printing money anymore? Well, something's changed, okay? The other thing is micromanage. John joked about Beaky before we got went live tonight. John Ross, he's in here tonight. And Beaky, like I talked about last week, is a stock that I micromanaged myself out of. And it was up another five bucks today, four four sixty three or something. But who's who's paying attention to that, right? <laughs> and we'll we'll actually come to that one in a minute. Uh, you may have fat fingered something. You know, you fat figure something that starts working, you decide to keep it, and then before you know it, you're kind of falling into like a bad behavior. Fat finger an order ten times the size it's supposed to be, or something like that. Believe me, it happens. Maybe you miss an initial profit target. Don't bother taking it, and the market comes right back in. Well, that's going to have not, a, not only a monetary impact on your account, but obviously a psychological impact on your account. On the flip side, maybe you let a stock blow through your stop. And then there's always fear. And, and as Douglas says, if you think about it, what you're fearing is not the markets, but your ability to do what you have to do when you have to do it. And I wanted to add that slide in tonight, and I probably will when we follow up on this, but you might want to write that down. And that's a paraphrase of what he said. So getting back to Selden, few persons who are so introspective as to be able to tell where this bias in favor of their own interest begins and where it leaves off. Again, it's kind of the, the cognitive bias. And I started to I started to throw some cognitive bias stuff in here, but that we would go way off on a tangent on that that's that's a bit of a rabbit hole but a lot of that stuff makes a lot of sense behavioral finance still fewer bother to make the effort to tell if you're long or short the market you are not an unprejudiced judge and you would be greatly tempted to put such an interpretation upon current events as will conceive with your preconceived notion well, that's saying, okay, it's I'm long this market, it's going straight down, but hey, it's starting to bounce. So I think that's a reversal, like we talked about earlier. As I've talked about quite a bit, a few points of a commodity trader by Longstreet, the book's about that big. Get a reprint, the originals cost a fortune. It's worth a fortune. The deeper secret for the trader is his ability to subordinate his own will to the will of the market. The markets will will be done. You need to write that down. Now, part of the tangent is a while back I talked about confidence and humility and how it's a bit of a balancing act. And I think that it kind of dovetails nicely into the drawdown stuff. Michael Steinhardt, famous hedge fund manager, said the balance between confidence, confidence and humility is best learned through experience, extensive experience, extensive experience and mistakes. I have the advantage of working with a lot of you guys and girls. And I see a lot of mistakes being made, reminds me of mistakes I've made and not to make them again. Not that I don't make a lot of stupid mistakes, but it does help me. And I'm humbled quite often. So it's a balancing act between the confidence and humility. So if you're confident that you picked the best, 
then you should be willing to accept what happens because you have to be process oriented as I preach in this business. And as what's his name, Terrence O'Dean has said before, outcomes are noisy. Sometimes good trades have bad outcomes and sometimes bad trades have good outcomes. And as I've beat the dead horse on, the market can be a really bad treat teacher. So you also have to be confident that you had have experienced a variety of conditions. The Robin Hood guys, unfortunately, a lot of those guys started blowing up when conditions began to change and the little go-go stocks they were changing, chasing, that is, the little go-go stocks they were chasing started getting choppy and stopped following through. Now, speaking to follow through, you have to be willing to accept that the market may not follow through. And that's the other thing, getting back to the drawdown, as I talked with a few of you guys personally recently about your drawdowns, it kind of goes back to that, what's changed, okay? Has the volatility come off? It seems to me like the bloom has come off the rose quite a bit. And I was fortunate enough to stop chasing rabbits because I was chasing some of these crazy stocks. And then one of my clients said, hey, you're chasing a lot of rabbits, aren't you? I'm like, oh, wait a minute. You know, maybe I am. Because one day I told him, it's like, I don't even know what's moving my portfolio, but I see the numbers are going up and I'm pretty excited about that. Well, that was the beginning of the end of that run. But again, you have to be confident that you've experienced a variety of conditions. And, you know, maybe I was going to say, if you started just started trading in 2020, you have an experience of a variety of conditions, but maybe that's wrong. I think uh, in one of the presentations I talked about, it's, it's trial by fire. 2020 was, that is. So you had a bull market, you had a bear market, you had a bull market, you had a child market. So you need to be confident that your methodology works well longer term. You need to know that it's conceptually correct. I learned that term long ago from Larry Connors. Every now and then I'd fat feed or something programming and I'd say, hey, Larry, take a look at the system. And he's like, hey, that's pretty neat. It makes a lot of money, but it actually makes no sense. And we couldn't figure out why it worked other than just blind luck or whatever. And even if something works really well, a lot of times, like Mr. Frey said, a lot of times it won't, okay? So you have to be willing to accept that sometimes it won't, even great stuff. Now, here's where things get a little bit dicey. When your confidence begins to rise too much, markets, let's say, in a persistent uptrend, and then you have a string of big outliers, as I often preach. If you're trend following, a lot of your money is going to come from one position often or a few positions. And if you have a few of those big positions working really well, you're going to get really, really confident. And let's say you met, well, I'll give you an example. It's probably not the best example, but a while, a few years ago, I did an IPO course and it's still working pretty good. And we're still trading IPOs. We talk about them a lot in the Facebook group, as you guys know. But I had a few people were making so much money trading IPOs, they quit, they quit trading the core methodology and they just, that's all they wanted to do. And it's like, well, look guys, that's gonna work for a while, but eventually it's not gonna work as well. I've had other people do really well with the core methodology before I did the IPO course and showed all those IPO patterns. They were like quitting jobs and successful businesses. It's like, why am I putting up with this douchey boss or, why am I working my fingers to the bone in this business that I took years to build when I could just click a few keys, make all this money trend trading? It's like, it's not always that great. And that leads to, that overconfidence leads to overtrading and of course leverage. And then that's where you get against that godlike complex. And the dangerous thing is, and we're going to get to a little bit of this in, in one second, but you have those feelings of permanent income hypothesis. I'm really guilty of annualizing things. And when I'm doing really well, I'm like, you know, if I just keep making a few thousand dollars a day, you know, it's going to be it's going to be a million dollars by the end of the year. This is fantastic on this one account, you know, and it, it doesn't quite work that way. As 
Galak Gilovich and Belsky once said, a rising tide lifts all egos. And that's when the humility comes in and you go back to being the burger flipper. Now, I've got a couple of questions coming in. Let's take a look at those real quick related to drawdowns. And then I wanna talk about surviving the drawdown. John says, after or during a drawdown, fear of getting back in has, has been a problem for me. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the, that's the part, that's the thing I was trying to get to earlier because I have a little bit of that. I have that problem too. It's like the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome. And I think Einstein is the person who said that first. And that's kind of what I was getting to by being detached and doing my analysis. It's like, well, let me find the best trade I can for my people. And then deep down knowing that I'm gonna take it, right? But I try to separate my feelings and my drawdown from the next big winner. And as you'll see here in one second, as we go through a few spreadsheets, I know, I bet you can't wait. <laughs> I thought about that. After I put about the 10th spreadsheet in tonight, I'm like, ah, oh, geez, you know, it's like, we're gonna look at a bunch of spreadsheets. How exciting is that? Well, if you're a trader, I think it's pretty exciting. You know, I'm a nerd. I don't know why I just don't talk a lot Bill Clinton. <laughs> Yeah, and there's things you could do you could do with that, John. Um, like I said, work to be detached. You know, I tell you what you do: try to find me the best setup you can, okay? And then send it to me, and then we'll put it in the Facebook group, and we'll 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 chew on it a little bit, and we'll you know we'll we'll take a look at it and make sure it's the best of the best of the best, and then that way you can start easing back in. Okay, Lawrence said I have done a chart and P and L post analysis. Since the 1st of July, I feel that the core methodology is giving back a lot of profits. Is this part of the mindset building before the next leg up? Do you see this on your own account too? Anything we should do better? Well, you, you're always working to get better, okay? And that's the thing about this business is you never, it's like you never reach a level like, okay, I got it, everything's fine. You know, you're always working to get better. Uh, as I said earlier, as a trend follower, you're gonna spend a lot of time less wealthy. And that's the thing. It's like right when you're about to give up, that's when all of a sudden you hit it out of the park. All it takes is two or three winners. And then you come flying out of the drawdown. As I've said before, I hit a drawdown. My wife's always like, well, how far is it going to go? I don't know. Well, when are you going to come out of it? I'm like, I don't know. It's like, so you don't know. And that's the kind of the dark part of it. But the way you wrap your head around that is you you live through enough cycles, good, bad, and indifferent. And one thing that I've talked about before, which is another thing, again, that we could add to this presentation or need to at some point, is that your equity curve is climbing and then begins to roll over as you get stopped out of your longs, and then it keeps going down. But then you start putting some shorts on, let's say like earlier this year when the market begins to roll over, well, then you start making money on your short side, and then it starts going back up or the market gets choppy or your equity curve goes up, then it starts rolling over. You get stopped out, stopped out, stopped out, stopped out, stopped out. Well, guess what? There's nothing else to buy. So it comes and it goes and it can be streaky at times. And as I've said before, without going off too far on a tangent, imagine that I've been told before or told after a speech once that I use the word streaky and it makes it, it, makes it sound too elusive, but sometimes it can be a little bit elusive. Chris says, elaborate please on trend following statement. Are you a trend follower and was stating that it sometimes doesn't work due to market conditions? Well, yeah, for sure. Uh, somebody was asking, you know, I'm always getting asked, what what could I expect? It's like, I don't know. I don't know. We get another 1999. You could expect to <laughs> expect to get a Lamborghini out of this whole deal, you know? <laughs> It, it, it all depends on, on the market conditions. And, and the secret is surviving the conditions when they're less than ideal, and also not letting it go to your head when they are ideal. And as I've said a thousand times, 
the best traders that are most successful longer term, they come in and grind it out, grind it out when things aren't fantastic, make a little, lose a little, make a little, lose a little. And then they finally hit it fairly big and they're like, okay, I get it. I do feel a little bit of that godlike complex, but I know based on my experience here, it doesn't always work this well, so I better be careful. The other people I've seen throughout the years, and there's been a lot of them, they get in sync with the market, they're trend following, and the market is just going one way, straight up or straight down, and they're absolutely printing money. But when things begin to change, they start fighting the last war, which is, I have, I have pages of, I have notes for like, tons and tons of stuff that I was supposed to, that I want to cover tonight. And we're just getting it, we're just scratching the surface here. But fighting the last war was one of them. Now, this is where we get into the spreadsheets real quick. One thing you need to do is stay the course. If that's what you're supposed to do. In other words, if you're not stopped out, then stick with the position. So let's do a little walkthrough here. I went back to earlier this October when things were looking the ugliest, or pretty ugly, I should say. And we had one trade that hit the initial profit target here, and this one was doing okay, wouldn't set the world on fire, but we had all these losers in the portfolio. And if you go back further than this, and then even as you'll see in a couple of these spreadsheets, a lot of times down here, this is where I recommend new setups in the service, I had none, okay? And that's because I didn't, feel like it was worth putting my capital in harm's way, nor should you. But it's for educational purposes only, just in case, <laughs> as the disclaimer said, but you get the idea. So a lot of losers in the portfolio going back. And this is where, like John just said, it's pretty hard to take another trade. But you kind of have to see that as something in and of itself. And if you saw that trade today, and here's where, again, we can go on, on so many tangents, but if you saw that trade again today, you feel like you'd have to take it. And even if that trade doesn't work out and you did your post-mortem, you'd feel like, you know what, it didn't work out, it happens, but I'll take this trade again tomorrow. And then also, as I preach, do the pre-mortem, also look at it and say, you know what, this thing looks really good. If I don't take it, I don't think I could live with myself because this is a perfect setup that I should take, okay? So we took it. What happened? It triggered and the first day, not much, 20 bucks. <laughs> not much. Ooh, Ross Perot's coming out. But we immediately have a little bit of loss. And now I'm thinking, oh boy, here we go again, okay? There's a Wendy's not far from here. Maybe I'll walk over there and see if they're still hiring, you know? Now in the portfolio, we did hit the initial profit target on one, so that's a good thing. And we had a little bit of trend trade in the rest, but then we got stopped out on one, okay? So, Net net, even with the one winning trade, we ended up losing money. Plus, we got a new loser so far, day one in the portfolio. Now, the next day, another one stopped out. And fortunately, one day into the U trade, We hit the initial profit target. It was a little bit less than the $1,000 we were looking for. And now our portfolio is looking better. We were a couple thousand dollars in the hole. Now we're almost $1,500 ahead. But we took another $2,000 loss. So the next day, portfolio is looking even, even better, much better, right? Unfortunately, we scratched out of the remainder of the U trade. But even though the portfolio looks pretty damn good, $3,500 and change, we took a 2K loss and a 2.1K loss. Fast forward one more day, 
We gave up a lot of open gains in the BCLI. And then now the portfolio is only up $630. Now we got a string of losses, both taken and untaken, okay? Kind of hard to take that next trade. So on a net net basis, the portfolio is kind of ugly. And then we've got to add into all that the gain from the unity from the day before from you. And then a 2K loss and a 2.1K loss gives you a negative $3,275 loss that has to be added into that profit. Okay. Just looking at it over this period. So we're not doing so hot. And then we've got a new setup coming in. Well, I liked the setup. I really, really liked the setup. And that's where. I can't say, oh my God, if I lose in the next trade, I'm just, I don't know what I'm going to do. Jump out the window, right? So we did take the next trade. And then that, what happened? Well, we had an immediate loss on that one. And then portfolio is looking pretty ugly. Plus we add in all those other losses and gains and now we're still twenty two hundred dollars in the hole we're not only eleven hundred dollars in the hole but we add everything up we're even further in the hole and then what happens we get stopped out on another one and we're still negative in the open portfolio so you add all those losses up that plus a negative 220. fast forward or jump ahead in this case, I think we jumped ahead a few days. So I just, I started jumping ahead so we get to the, the days that are rel relevant. Now, this is a loss in a portfolio, but it was up two or three bucks. So it, it came off, the loss came off a little bit, but then notice what happened with the C or SR. It hit the initial profit target. In this case, we didn't get the full loaf on that. But over the next couple of days, we got a little bit more out of it. So this makes this look a lot better. But we still have quite a bit of losses on a net net basis and a little bit of gains when you add it all up. And by the way, this is something that maybe Laurent kind of was, uh, this might kind of answer Laurent a little bit. This $800 and $1,000, and these are, these are where you hit the swing trade portion, but the market comes right back in and stops you out. The real money is when you hit the swing trade portion like this one up here, and then this number becomes really, really big. Would you hang on to that stock for a long, long time and are not stopped out? Hopefully, knock on wood, this CRSR becomes the second loaf trade, okay? And maybe the APG to where it turns into a much, much bigger trade. Now we add all that up. I'm doing all that math and I'm trying not to bore you too much, too late, right? And after we do all the math, we started with a negative 1728. And then we added all the gains and losses in in the open portfolio and it comes to 49 bucks in three weeks, okay? Well, that's certainly not worthwhile, right? So it's not very impressive. But you have to stay the course. And then we throw in today's portfolio and now we're up a couple hundred bucks. You can see $2,700 gains, better than the Pokemon eye. Now, where I would often this spreadsheet tangent to show you going through the drawdown and the pain in the ass of the drawdown and all the other good stuff was I came into this morning, super early this morning, and this CRSR was up a couple of bucks. So it was way up here. Now mark to market, that's another 800 bucks. Improvement, okay? So, at another 800 bucks, it's starting to look like, okay, this thing is starting to work a little bit. And that's kind of the, the idea. I just assumed, I know, I never assumed this business, right? But I assumed that we'd see some nice follow through in these today. And the DPHC was coming off its lows too. And like last night, I had it back, when I was thinking about that one. Last night was doing really well in after hours. So I was thinking between these two, 
we're going to print money today by continuing to follow the system. Now, the point is, I know I didn't knock your socks off, but the question is, yet, okay? If you have something that's conceptually correct, and don't take my word for it, okay? And, and I can explain it to you. It's a, it's a trend. It's a persistent trend. It's an accelerating trend. It's pulled back deeply enough to knock some people out. You get in here, you give it enough room just in case you're stopped out, but enough room to hold, I'm sorry, you give it enough room to hopefully capture that swing trade, okay, without getting stopped out first. And then if you capture that swing trade, you take half your profits and then you trail you stop in the remainder. And then you end up with one or two and hopefully a few more. I know I just said hope, big, huge winners over a period of time and you make a lot of money. But don't take my word for it. Go in and do your own analysis and see if my patterns work to your liking and follow along. Now, I didn't blow your socks off, but I think if you give things time, as I often preach, you never know when the next big winner will come along. Or the other thing is, well, why not get out of all those losers? Well, as long as they're not stopped out. Now, the DPHC is, is not making a good example for me. It's like last few weeks, every time I was hoping, and I just said hope again, but every time I'm hoping for a great example, what happens? Well, <laughs> it doesn't follow through, okay? But sometimes, as long as you don't hit the stop, sometimes the market will come back. And I've done quite a few dead money reports this year of stocks that just trigger and then just die for a while. BCLI was the last one. Unfortunately, that one didn't keep running, but you get the idea. Chewy was one before that. Way back, it was AU, it was gold stock. Went, went dead for like three months. And I could watch the Facebook chatter and tell everybody's getting tired of it. You know, it's like, I, I start seeing complaints about, oh, this piece of crap stock, you know? As I preach, outliers are key. And, you know, this is stuff that I often wonder, when's the next outlier gonna come along? And usually it comes along right when people start giving up on the service. And shit, I'm ready to get up, give up on the service sometimes, you know, truth be told, okay? But when I start seeing people give up, when I start, when I'm frustrating myself, when other people start getting frustrated, I'm like, okay, we're getting, we're getting closer. As Mark Douglas said, and I've said a thousand times, a good salesman makes a few sales calls, rejected, 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 goes get a cup of coffee comes back to his desk, knowing that he's getting closer and closer and closer to a sale because he's got the bad sales calls out. Whereas a bad salesman makes two or three or four calls, rejection, 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 gets depressed and goes drink his lunch. That's a late great Mark Douglas. Now, from a psychological standpoint, it's better to look at winning numbers and losing ones by letting things stop out. So that comes back to following the plan. So what I'm saying there is even though you're in a drawdown, when you let things stop out and they come out of the portfolio, from a psychological perspective, that portfolio, that open portfolio, okay, notice we were like down about 2K and then all of a sudden we're up two or three K in that portfolio. Well, that doesn't make up for all the sense. I'm not trying to sweep that under the rug, but by letting things stop out and, and following the plan, following the plan, following the plan, and let the ebb and flow control your portfolio and letting those things stop out, again, you're gonna be left with winners in a portfolio. I was thinking earlier today, Years ago, as I told the story before, I think I wrote about it in, might've been my first book. I was kind of bummed out and my hanging my head low and I walked into the gym. And back then I, I, I thought I knew more than I did about the markets. And the receptionist, you know, I wear my feelings on, sleeve, on my sleeve and, it's, and she's like, what's wrong? And I'm like, eh, I'm in a bunch of bad stocks. And she's like, what's wrong? I'm gonna buy some good ones. <laughs> it's like, what the hell do you know? I have an MBA, woman. <laughs> well, evidently she knows more than I do. Now, don't just outright sell them, but sell them when they get stopped out, okay? And then as those bad stocks get knocked out, you're going to be left with good stocks. 
When? I don't know. If I knew that, you'd never see my fat ass again. Now, you can't let the negative feelings cloud your judgment on the next trade. Ha ha, easier said than done. But like I said, me being detached in that analysis makes my job easier. So from a self-fulfilling standpoint, the, the service actually, it, it actually helps me do better, okay? And I've said that before, like, okay, you're, you're kind of all over the place and you're trading. Why don't you make a plan? Why don't you say, look, I'm going to follow this Dave Leonard guy, and this is his plan, and this is his methodology, this is what he's doing, and here's his trades he's recommending, and here's his landry list. I'm going to follow these trades, or I'm going to follow my own trades, which are trades which are very similar to that. I'm going to enter here, put my stop here, take my partial profits here, lay out this whole trading plan, and share it with your wife. And the reason I told him that was because he was firing off a bunch of day trades, lo losing a bunch of money in the meantime. And he said, oh, no, that would end the marriage. So you have to be willing to take responsibility of, of what you're doing and actually show it to someone. OK, uh, you know, you guys want to do some of this in the group, bring up a trade and we'll talk about it and we'll see. You know, it's hard for me to to buy a stock and then hold on to it after it hits a stop when I know I should get out. Because if I recommended that trade, I better make darn sure. Well, number one, I take the trade. Number two, if I get stopped out, I stopped out. And no, number three, if we hit the initial profit target, if we're blessed with that, I take partial profits. Now, the negative feelings are tough. And, and believe me, I know. Been there, done that. I'm there now, okay? But quitting and missing the next mother of all trades is really demoralizing, okay? And that's where getting back to like we talked about last week and week prior and week before that, I think too, is the must take trade versus the mistake trade, okay? A must take trade is that beautiful textbook type of setup that I can't really pick apart, you can't really pick apart, you just have to take it, okay? And you'll have that feeling after it takes a while, but it, you'll you'll get it. It's kind of takes me makes me think back to Malcolm Malcolm Gladwell's Blink, and I was I've been looking for that book. I haven't found it yet. There's so many things that have gone missing in the move. But they talk about how an expert can see something in a snap, and not that I'm saying I'm the grand poobah or anything, but when I'm doing my analysis at night, I'm going through those couple thousand charts, and I'm just flipping through, flipping through, flipping through. All of a sudden, the big winner just jumps right out. The BCLI is one jump right out, beaky, beat myself over the head on that one again, right? Jumps right out at me, okay? Now, there's a saying, and I don't know, I don't think it's that true. I think it's been debunked, and I don't think anybody wants to go out and find out <laughs> to debunk it. But there's an old saying that if, if an alligator eats you, just go kind of limp, you know, and he'll, he'll like go hide you somewhere, and then when he swims off, you, you swim off, and you're gonna be fine. Well. I doubt that seriously, but work with me. So the point is that the more you fight it, the more the alligator, the faster the alligator will eat you, okay? And that's probably, that point is true, okay? You're not gonna survive an alligator attack by going limp, but he's just gonna eat you a little slower, right? Well, if you try to force things, you're not gonna come out of that drawdown. In fact, you're going to, make things worse. And if you go back and look at those spreadsheets we did earlier, I know you want to party with me, you know, I want to party with you when you're looking at spreadsheets, right? But you'll notice on a lot of them for the new position, I'd say none tonight. And there's a few, if you go to DaveLeonard.com slash archives, then a link will pop up here in a second, it should. Then you'll see that there were days and days and days and days and days when I said do nothing, okay? So that's where you don't want to push the envelope and just try to force a trade to happen. And I've been guilty of that before where I've had a string of losses thinking like, well, there's no way I can have another loss. And you can. And part of the string of losses, the problem was that after a few losses, I was not being selective. I was just looking for something. So sometimes less is more. And there's the old beaky trade. I micromanage myself out right there, okay? And on just 100 shares, that makes a $1,990 difference. And that's 2% on a 100K account because you're only supposed to buy 200 shares of this particular stock. 
And as John pointed out, it's up to the other way, $3.62, $4.62 today or whatever. So let's just round all these numbers up. So I would have another $2,500 had I taken this trade, okay? And that would be across multiple accounts. I have several accounts that I use. So you start adding all that up and it's painful and it begins to hurt. And you're probably thinking, why do you keep beating a dead horse in this beaky trade when it stresses you out? Well, I'm trying to learn a lesson myself here. And, and this is something I talked about quite a bit in the past. And it's interesting, I'm reading Denise Scholl's book and she actually talks about something very similar. But you have to you have to feel the pain. It makes me think of the Dinosaur Junior song, feel the pain of everyone and then I feel nothing. It's like you really have to embrace the drawdown. You had to lean into the suck, right? And it has to hurt, okay? And when you do stupid things, it should really hurt you. It shouldn't cripple you, but it should really hurt you. And it was interesting, Ms. Scholl talked about like a grieving process where you feel the pain of it. And, and I agree. So that's one reason I keep bringing up the beaky, but it just goes to show you how by not staying the course, well, Dave, why'd you get out? Well, I had a dollar 43 profit in this thing left over. And I'm like, you know what? I'm not letting it go back to zero. Well, that's where my stop was. My stop was at break even. And I'm like, you know what? Everything is going, everything is crappy at the moment. I'm gonna just get out of this one, okay? And that one trade, it might not have solved my drawdown, but it certainly would have helped considerably. The next thing is be selective. Good comment, uh, Dakota. We'll uh, take a look at that when we get there. And that's why I said earlier, if you go and look at those archives or just go look at the spreadsheets real quick, you'll notice that there were days after days after days where there was nothing that I felt like was worth trading. And it's a bit of a cycle. You you start making a lot of money and all of a sudden you get a little careless, you start taking mediocre setups and then you start kind of rolling over in that equity and all of a sudden you're like, whoa, wait a minute, you know? If you're in a hole, stop digging. So that means that you have to stop digging by not putting on mediocre setups it doesn't mean that you quit trading you have to keep chipping away at it and maybe that crsr or the beaky trade damn it <laughs> will get you out of the hole one thing you got to be careful is don't try something new i wake up every morning and write a few pages and i've i've looked at some of my notes it's like what if you did this in the spoos or did this you know and, and it's like Ugh, such a bad idea the peas now, just to kind of sum it up real quick, and, and believe me, we can go into a lot more detail. We probably will, now that we've kind of scratched the surface here. But you want to identify what's changed. You check your life. Is it the markets? Check your methodology. And then accept the fact that a lot of time you'll spend less wealthy as a trend follower. Markets back and fill a lot. Great trends and trades don't come along every day. Less is more, as I just said quite a bit. When you do find yourself in that hole, become more and more selective, taking the best of the best. And if you can't stand it, when that trade looks so fantastic, you go in there and you take that trade. And another thing too is don't fight the last war. All right, I kind of talked a lot about the Facebook group because everybody here tonight live is in the group or most everybody here. And I enjoy you guys and girls a lot. Trading can be a lonely sport. I, my wife has said repeatedly, that's the best thing that I've ever done is start that Facebook group. It's really helped me out a lot. We all go through these struggles. Well, it's kind of, it kind of helps if we all kind of go through them together and like, hey, you know what? I just got my ass handed to me in this trade. Hey, so did I, you know, and it makes you feel a little bit better about it. It's like, hey, I just got this big winner. Hey, so did I, you know? <laughs> but the great thing is you can interact with other traders and, and the group is, is a, is vetted okay it's vetted in that you have to be a gold member of davelander.com and occasionally we'll throw out some trades such as ipos and ogres and things like that all right let's hop into the charts i ran long tonight imagine that okay dakota says and you guys start asking about stock questions because i ran late here i'm gonna get through all this so we can all have plenty of time to go uh watch the debate Okay, Dakota says, hey Dave, hoping you can comment on what's wrong with the setup. Might have helped many of us. 
long last week at 45. I took long last week at 45 at IPG at 52. I have a stop at 40, still in a trade, so trying to learn from it. Okay, this was one. Well, nothing, nothing is nothing is wrong with it. The only thing, you know, and this might be in hindsight, but I did notice that it did, it was a really, really, really deep retracement, okay? Borderline, almost 100% retracement, but I know I did have this one on the list for a while. And let's check the volume. The volume is okay. The volume's dried up a little bit. That That's part of what's wrong with it. But for the most part, I, I don't think anything is wrong with it, okay? I mean, take a look at like Unity, okay? This damn thing took off and then it came all the way back in and knocked us out for a scratch. And then what happened, it took off again, okay? It, it comes with the territory, you know, and, and these IPOs, love them and you hate them, you know, but, but they're so worthwhile because when they go and keep going, it's like, but like the CRSR, okay? We got in here and at least this morning, it was, pretty amazing right okay steve's got to go i'll cover that for you i'll be happy george says you rock thank you george checks in the mail <laughs> okay uh let's let me make a note of that i just deleted this question by accident all right let's go through the market real quick i'm not going to spend a whole lot of time there's not a tremendous amount to report the s p 500 Came down and tagged a 30 EMA today. We're back above the 20, still below the 10. Not too far from all-time highs, but obviously still got to get there. So we're going to have to see what's going to happen tonight. I'll be watching those futures tonight during the debate. NASDAQ composite, same sort of pattern there. Mortgage is kind of hanging in there. The good news is we survived this recent little correction in here. So for the most part, kind of hanging in there. Russell 2000 looks a little bit better, a little bit more encouragement in Russell. Nice little day to day up one and three quarters percent still not still it didn't bang out all-time highs which would be way back here okay so there's a little ways to go but almost there so russell's looking really good the some of these areas in here not all is great in the world though like biotech you can see rolled back over in here that's this is drugs but biotech's going to look a lot like that so that's a bit of a bum, bummer i know there's some excitement tonight i think with the um i don't see, I, I don't have them I, just, I looked at the name to, to pronounce it, but the drug was pr uh, approved tonight for Gilead, and maybe that'll give some, I know, confusing issue with facts. But Biotech had a good day today, but you can see these moving averages have turned back down because price is back below them. So that's a little questionable. Most areas are looking pretty good. Semiconductors just off of all-time highs. Retail has pulled back in after breaking out, but not the end of the world just yet. As long as these areas stay at or above their 30 EMA, I think that they're okay. That's that's kind of a there's nothing magical about that, but it's a good it's a good little litmus test, so to speak. And as long as the bow ties remain in uptrend proper order, meaning that the 10 is greater than the 20, the 20 is greater than 30, 20 and 30 are exponential averages for those who are new to the system and bow ties the market is okay, whatever the market they may be. But take a look at health services, banging out new highs in here. Somebody was talking about bonds earlier. Uh, good point. Bonds are not looking so hot, okay? Banging out brand new lows, not new lows for the year, obviously, but new lows, where's the moving averages, okay? Which way they're headed? What order are they in? Is there daylight or Landry light as we now call it? Uh, yes to all of those on the downside. So bonds, yes, not looking so hot. In here, let's take a look at a dollar. A dollar is kind of questionable too. Maybe it's bottoming out longer term, but you can see it's dipped back below the moving averages they turned down. Nothing magical about the bow ties or Landry Light or whatever you want to use. But as you can see, when and when being a key word in that sentence, everything works better with trend. But when being a key word in that sentence, the moving averages are in proper order and you have the Landry Light and all, and then a trend develops, it could be pretty nice. So you'd be short this market for a long, long time based on that. Now, one thing I've been thinking about lately is you don't want to find the mechanical edge and go out and trade it mechanically, but find an edge and trade within it, okay? So should you be long or short a market? Use those two little metrics to decide on whether you want to decide on whether or not you want to be long or short a market and then figure out where you're going to get in. S&P 500, for instance, okay? 
Well, you've got Landry Light to the downside back here. You got a pullback, you got a bow tie to the downside. Hmm, what do I want to do? Well, this, the trend, the emerging trend looks like it's headed lower. I want to be short this market, okay? And then conversely, when everything flips back up to the upside, you say, okay, I want to be long this market. Is persistency better than a moving average? I absolutely love persistency, but here's the deal. If you have persistency, it's going to work just as well as a moving average. You had persistency here, you had persistency here, your bow ties, proper order, and land your light down to the 30 EMA. Good question. But yeah, I absolutely love persistency. Take a look at DCLI, okay? What do we have before this thing imploded? Let's go way back to where it first set up. Okay, you had obviously the bow ties are in proper uptrend order. You had, look, I've got it drawn in for you here. You had persistency and then you had a little acceleration followed by a nice little correction down to the 30. That's a textbook setup. Write that down. Take a picture of it. Take a screenshot of it. And I've talked about this stock at nausea. Unfortunately, what happened? Well, it looked like it was off to the races. We were doing pretty good. We got a profit out of it, came back in and imploded. Laurent was asking earlier, hey, man, uh, is this typical give up all this money? Well, it comes with the territory, but if this thing went to 32, I know, big if, you know, if my aunt had, I guess nowadays, your aunt could be your uncle, your uncle could be your aunt, but you get the idea. You know, instead of going down to 10, if it went up another six points, then obviously it would be a completely different picture. So maybe the CRSR, there's always hope, right? You had to hope a little bit. Maybe the CRSR will be the mother of all examples. I really thought this was the turn of the mother of all examples. And it did work out. And this is the other case where somebody said, stay, we were talking about stay the course earlier. Somebody said, hey, just follow your plan. Well, it was hard to watch this thing go, go below the entry, you know, after, after it triggers and then it implodes a little bit. It's hard to watch it day after day after day. You're underwater. You're underwater about a month in this stock and it's going sideways to lower. It's like, well, why not get out? Well, Follow the, follow the plan, stay the course. All right, let's take a look at some individual stocks. George says earlier, said follow, follow the plan, absolutely. Confidence, yeah, then you, you build confidence through experience and, and you get experience, you know, what's, what's the old saying? Experience, good experience comes from a lot of bad experience, you know, and that's, that's could I be more true than in the markets? I've been watching this one, and I think I've had this on the Landry list here and there. Who asked about this? Chris, my only problem now is it's kind of like the EXPI, and, and the it was kind of on the cusp, and that's why I put it on the Landry list a couple of nights ago, but then it came all the way back in. Notice that it's come all the way back into its breakout levels, so I would immediately rule this one out, okay? It might turn right back around and go straight up, but... Based on that, I'll scratch it from my list. In fact, if it's still in my momentum list, when I clean it up tomorrow, the next day, it'll come out. Okay, BYND. Yeah, BYND looks pretty good, okay? We talked about this pattern with the, let's see if I got it somewhere else in here. We talked about the bow tie pattern. I'm sorry, we talked about the Landry light pattern. Notice that we do have the Landry light. It comes down and tags the 30 EMA. So if we hop over to ACP and we add in the Landry light and we use a 30 EMA and then let's just use 10 for trend, okay? And we close this down and we put in Beyond Meat. I'm going to eat some real meat tonight. We're making a, uh, we're going to make a ribeye stew, but the, which one calls on sale? Uh, T-bones are on sale. There's a butcher literally across the street from my house. Well, you got to walk a little ways. Not quite across the street, but figuratively across the street. How's that? But yeah, as far as the Landry light, this is kind of a, this is a good looking setup, okay? Now, when you look at it longer term, you might find some issues with it, but for the most part, let's see if we can get like three years or something. For the most part, it's it's a good looking setup. So yeah, I'll give you a high five on that one. That's a pretty good looking setup. All right, let me get back to the other one. I'm, I'm running really late. I'm gonna have to get moving here. 
Trex. Trex I like, or used to like at least. I don't know about if I like it anymore. Yeah, it's another one of those things, George, where like we talked about a minute ago, it broke out, but then it came right back in. So I like to see the prior peak taken out, okay? It's all it's come all the way back in. So I would leave that one alone. But yeah, put it on your momentum list. Plug, I think, is on my list tonight, or is it not? Let's see. Yeah, plug looks perfect. There you go. There's your there's another one of those Landry Light setups. Now it did pull almost all the way back this level here, but it took off so it went straight up before it did it. Okay. So it's a little bit different than like the last one that took off and came back into where it broke out. Okay. So plug, it looks a little bit better based on that. Let's see if we can get back to it. Okay. Yeah. Plug looks good. Yeah. We're going to have to get moving here. FTHM long above 2020, 2050 F. Now that's one that I was watching for a while. It looks okay. It, it is an IPO, so I'm a little bit more lenient. I won't talk out of both sides of my mouth. But I, I don't like the way it's come back in below this prior breakout. But yeah, I hear you. I think you could be a little bit more lenient and take a trade like this. This one was on the Landry list for a while. It's getting kind of thin now, okay? So not crazy that it came back in, but but I'll, I agree with you. It looks okay. QTRX. Or John, yeah, John, it looks good. Looks pretty good. It's a little on the thin side, okay, but not, you know, it's tradable. But it's only, it's less than two hundred thousand shares. And I find this year I've been trading a little bit higher volume stocks. The the thinner stocks have have been a little bit more treacherous. It seems. I don't know if it's just me feeling that, but you remember you came up with the Hotel California and the IPOs where they just got to die out on you. But yeah, that's not a bad looking stock. It's come out of its base. One thing I've been trying to do, and I talked about this at a service tonight, as you know, if you watched the service already, I've been trying to find something that hasn't already banged out these multi-year highs or all-time highs. But there's certainly nothing wrong with that. I like that it came out of a base. I like that it came out of a base here. You know, it's one of these box stocks, okay? And if you can identify these box stocks ahead of time, you know, in the world. And I need to go back and finish up that Darvis work that I was doing a while back. So much to do. So a little time. NBTA. We're going to have to wrap it up too. TA. Yeah, this looks good. Who asked about this? Laurent? You got good volume. Let's take a look at the 30 EMA. Yeah, that's that's a good looking stock. Okay. Again, I'd like to see something a little bit earlier in the process. It really didn't set up earlier though. That's a, that, not that I could see a quick look, quick glance. But yeah, that looks pretty damn good. Uh, let me give you a high five on that one. But yeah, it's a nice little, I'll see you've got acceleration higher, you got a little bit of persistency, and then you got a pullback. And then notice that this pullback is way up here. The base is way back here. First pullback after a base breakout, acceleration pullback. Yeah, high five. That's a good looking stock, okay? Absolutely. All right, we got time for one more and then we'll wrap it up. By the way, if you're watching on YouTube, please hit like below, leave a comment. I respond to all comments on YouTube. If you have any questions or anything, you can also go to davelander.com for some follow-up information. All right, I wanna thank everybody for coming tonight. If you're watching it as a recording, I really appreciate it. George has great stuff. Yeah, George, I told you to check out the mail, buddy. <laughs> I appreciate it though, thank you so much. All right, everybody have a great night. If we don't talk between now and then, everybody have a fantastic weekend. Thank you guys and girls so much.